The Holy Gospel, appointed for this first Sunday in Lent, is recorded in the book of Luke, the fourth chapter we pick up at the first verse. Um, Context-wise, just bear in mind, Jesus has just been baptized, and that's where we pick up now today. So Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until a more opportune time. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. After 40 days of fasting in the middle of the desert wilderness, Satan comes to Jesus with three very simple propositions. You know, you kick a man when he's down, right? You hit him when he's at his lowest. So the three simple propositions, well, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. If you fall down and worship me, all of this earthly authority and glory will be all yours. If you are the son of God, if you really are the son of God, Throw yourself down from this highest point on the temple. Let God's angels catch you. Now, do you notice what the devil is not doing in uh, in all these temptations? He's not coming at Jesus with all the fires and terrors of hell, you know, pitchforks blazing in this, this attempt to force and coerce and scare poor little weak Jesus into doing something against his will. No. Nope. Rather, the devil is using an almost childish playground tactic against Jesus. You know, if you really are the Son of God, prove it. I dare, I double dog dare you. I don't believe you. But Jesus didn't bite, right? He didn't take the bait. He didn't give in to the temptations that were aimed at exploiting the most basic human weaknesses. Weaknesses like an empty stomach or a lack of patience or or selfish feelings of wanting to be in charge and wanting to be in control and exercise power. Uh, You know, um, the weakness of doing whatever you want to do right now and then you just expect God to cover for you later on. Now, Jesus didn't give in to any of that. He he didn't give in to the the temptations of instant and immediate gratification, confident in the fact that he'll just ask for forgiveness later, you know, after he's had his fill and after he's had his fun. Basically, what we can say here is that Jesus didn't give in to or fall prey to the very basic temptations that you and I give in to and fall prey to all the time. See, Jesus does for us what we don't do and what we can't do for ourselves. He doesn't give in to these temptations. Rather, he trusts in his God and Father perfectly above all things, even above his own personal comforts and desires. You say, all right, all right. So why does he do all this? Well, the answer probably isn't what you think. The answer certainly isn't what is so often wrongly taught nowadays. You see, Jesus does all this. He, He battles Satan and withstands all the temptations that Satan throws at him. He does this not to provide a mere example for us to follow, as if we could even follow that example, Um, because, well, let's face it, if we could do these things, if we could follow Jesus' example, well, then Jesus didn't need to die, did he? No, that's not why Jesus does these things. Jesus does all these things 
for us, all right, in our stead, in our place. He does these things because we can't do these things, because we don't do these things for ourselves. I mean, just think about it. If Jesus was simply you know, some poster boy example of what you need to do in your own life, if Jesus' actions against Satan were, were nothing more than an easy-to-follow set of examples that you need to duplicate in your life in order to beat the devil and win the heavenly crown of victory, if that was the case, then you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus have to take on flesh and suffer and die? Because if it comes down to nothing more than, well, do what Jesus did, then our salvation would no longer be grounded in faith and grace. It would, it would now instead be founded upon the rock of personal willpower and hard work, you know, which we would call works righteousness, although nobody would ever be stupid enough to call it that. You know, do what Jesus did, and if that's not working out for you, try harder. As I don't know about you. Uh, I can confess that if my salvation hinged upon my abilities to be just like Jesus, I'm doomed. No matter how hard I try or how good my intentions are, I'm doomed. That's just it. You know, I can't be like Jesus. I can't do what Jesus did. You know, I examine myself through the lens of God's perfect law, and I very quickly discover that I'm rotten, dead to the sinful core. No matter how hard I try, no matter how pure my intentions may be, I can't do what is necessary, according to the law, to make atonement for even one of my sins, let alone an entire life's worth of sins. See, this is precisely why Jesus came to do what he did. He did it because I can't do it. And sometimes, yes, if I'm bold to confess, sometimes I simply don't do it, knowingly and willingly. You know, there are times I just don't want to do it. I mean, let's face it, the way of the cross isn't nearly as easy or gratifying as the path of least resistance is. You know, that, that comfortable carpool lane of sin that old Adam prefers as he navigates this dark and shadowy valley that we call life. You know, go along to get along, right? Don't make waves. It, you know, it doesn't have to be so difficult. Besides, you know, I'm still a good Christian, even if I don't necessarily bear up all my crosses. Besides, everyone else is doing it. You know, if it feels good and makes me happy, well, it can't be all that bad, right? Besides, I mean, won't God forgive me anyway? You know, that that's quite often my mindset, guys. I confess that not proud of it, but I confess it. And the reality is, that same sinful reality, that same sinful mindset is true for each and every person born of sinful Adam, you included. So yeah, contrary to what is so often preached from pulpits all across our fair land, what we see here in this gospel lesson, it's not a method or a, a how-to guide in how you overcome temptation and beat the devil. No, no. What we see here is our perfect and complete substitute taking our place and doing perfectly for us what we cannot and do not do. And he's doing it all so that his perfect obedience and faithfulness could be credited to us for our salvation. You see, that's what's so often lost in this lesson. It's a lesson that your church forefathers were very wise in appointing as the first lesson of the Lenten season. You see, this text sets the tone, not just for Lent, but for the entire Christian life. It's always all about Jesus, right? It's always all about our perfect and complete substitute. And he, he is our perfect and complete substitute in every way, shape, and form, from conception to resurrection to ascension. He takes our place in temptations. He does for us what we cannot and do not do. He takes our place in fulfilling God's law perfectly. And in spite of that perfect obedience, he takes our place in suffering the justly deserved wrath of God against sin, our sin. He takes our place in dying the death that our sin has earned. And he does all these things for us so that we don't die, so that we can have the gift of eternal life. He does all of this for us simply because he loves us. 
You see, it's all about Jesus. It's all about what God does for us. It's all about God's love for us. Now, before we close, I, I do want to bring attention to a point in the gospel text here that's so often overlooked. It's just one little blurb at the end there. You know, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until a more opportune time. Folks, the devil didn't simply quit after Jesus had bested him that one time in the wilderness. The devil never quits. I mean, case in point, Satan, Satan came right back at Jesus with the very same temptation three years later when Jesus was hanging on his cross. He says, if you are the Son of God, boy, where have we heard that before, right? If you are the Son of God, well, save yourself, prove it, come down off your cross. Guys, the devil's no dummy. He, he didn't stop working on Jesus after he was bested that one time in the wilderness. He just waited for a more opportune time. I mean, he didn't even bother to use different temptations. He used the same old temptation. He, he just waited for a more opportune time to strike. The time when that temptation would now have more influence and leverage and power. Look to that cross of Jesus. I mean, you want to talk about a more opportune time. What's more opportune than being at the very end of your rope, completely forsaken and forgotten by everyone you love, including God himself? You know, the devil's not dumb. You kick a man when he's down. You get him when he's low, when he's at his lowest, when he's terrified, when he's frightened. I mean, that's when people are the most vulnerable, right? We got two years to prove it, don't we? These last two years prove it. Folks, look at that cross. It doesn't get any more vulnerable than this. And if this was the case with Jesus, you know, the devil tempts him at this point. If this was the case with Jesus, well, what makes you think the devil's going to stop working on you simply because you maybe overcame his temptations before, you know, you know, when things were relatively easier and you weren't so low in the depths of sorrow and suffering? You kick a man when he's down, right? See, the reason I bring all this up is because all too often we, quote-unquote, good Christians, we still fall prey to the devil's temptations, don't we? Especially when things really heat up in life and get difficult. I mean, being a faithful Christian is certainly never easy on this side of eternity. I don't think anybody's going to say it is. But you know as well as I do that when things are down, when the anxiety level gets tweaked up, when the fear level or the anger level gets turned up, that's when the devil swoops in to take full advantage of these, these more opportune opportunities. You know as well as I do that suffering and exhaustion and depression and anger and anxiety and fear, they all make a person do some pretty stupid and sinful things, don't they? Satan jigs and we take the bait, hook, line, and sinker. I mean, uh, something simple. Just take away a person's sense of being in charge or being in control and see how sinfully stupid they get. Don't look around. Look in the mirror because it happens all the time and it happens to all of us. Whether it's feelings of being in control about our health or our wealth or, or even something as petty as carpet color or who's in charge of the ladies' bake sale. I mean, you want to talk about opportunity. Man's pride is the easiest thing to prey upon. You take away that feeling of being in control. You just challenge that feeling of being in control. And the sinful foolishness ignite, ignites like gasoline on a fire. Guys, Satan may offer the gas and he may offer the match, but we're the ones who do the dousing all by ourselves. We strike that match all by ourselves. And then we dare to wonder why everything's on fire. Yeah, I, sure, we, we can stand firm and resist Satan when the temptations are relatively small and life's going well. But again, you know, when life takes a turn south, when, when things don't go according to our plans, well, <laughs> look, it, it doesn't matter how good or bad life is going. 
And I say this knowing full well how our world has been going these past couple of years and how our world is going right now. All right? Guys, the circumstances don't matter. It doesn't matter how or when the devil tempts you. Uh, as long as you reside on this side of eternity, the devil's going to be after you. He's never going to quit. He will bombard you with temptations until you draw your very last breath. See, the circumstances of the temptations don't matter. The answer is always the same. Look to and hold fast in repentant faith to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. St. James says in his epistle, and I quote, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You say, resist? Well, uh, didn't we just hear that that's not what it's about? How, do we, how are we supposed to resist faithfully and rightly? Easy. Easy. You resist the devil by simply holding fast to and holding up Christ alone. Where Christ stands, the devil must flee. Richer, poorer, in sickness, in health, better, worse, in times of war, in times of peace, in times of feast, or in times of famine. Look, it, none of it matters. You look to and hold fast to your Lord and Savior. Look to and hold fast to your perfect and complete substitute who did it all perfectly and completely for you. And he did it all because he loves you. It is finished, right? In Christ alone and because of Christ alone. It is finished. Faith alone in God's grace alone, which is ours, solely because of the all-atoning work and person of our perfect and complete substitute, Jesus Christ alone. Guys, that's what it's all about. Faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. It's that simple. And thanks be to God that it is. Amen.